Hello and welcome to A Novel Idea, the show where we talk to authors about their books. Uh, my name is Noelle Bach. I am your host and I am also the director of the Peabody Institute Library here in Danvers. And so today I want to welcome Luna McNamara. Hello, Luna. Hello. <laughs> welcome it's to the a, show. It's a pleasure to be so here. So she wrote her very first book, which is right here, uh, called Psyche and Eros. So first, very easy question is, why? <laughs> Why did you choose um, this myth, like a rewriting of this myth, to be your first book? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So part of it was I have always been really fascinated by the Eros and Psyche myth. Mm -hmm. I remember I was like pretty young at summer camp when I first heard a camp counselor telling a version of the story. And I was so intrigued by it because, first of all, the woman in the story, Psyche, She's the one who really undergoes these labors, who saves her beloved, um, and shows a lot of agency and has a lot more things to do than women in Greco-Roman mythology often do. Um, and there's also the fact that the original myth has a happy ending, which is pretty rare in mythology <laughs> and in real life. Also true. <laughs> so I was very intrigued by the romance of it, by Psyche's capacity for agency. And I, during the pandemic, I had written a version of this story before, but I suddenly had all of this time on my hands, mm. as many of us did. And I, I wanted to keep going with it. I wanted to see where the story could go. I wanted to see what kind of spin I could put on it, what sort of lessons I could draw away from it that maybe weren't the most apparent or obvious or traditional. Um, and I was realizing more and more it, as I did it that there's a lot in the myth and especially my, well, I think especially my interpretation of it that does kind of speak to the modern world. Um, like Psyche is, she co sort of goes down one path in life and then realizes that maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be, that she's not too small for the dream, that maybe the dream is too small for her. Mm. So as I kept writing it, I found myself falling into the story more and more and eventually I was able to find an agent and get to publication. So it seems like it has resonated with other people as well. Yeah, for sure. Did, now, have you always been fascinated with lots of Greek mythology, or is it just that particular myth that really drew you? I've always been a huge Greek mythology <laughs> nerd. Like, I was one of the ones in middle school. I was reading through the books. Um, and also, as I got older, I actually originally wanted to be an academic. I got a master's degree in the study of women, gender, and religion from Harvard University, and then realized that academia is kind of a dumpster fire. Like, you'll be <laughs> teaching adjunct classes, or you'll have to move somewhere you've never been to get a job. And also, the approach to knowledge in academia is really you find your little, you find your little molehill and you stake your claim on it, and that's all you do. Whereas I, I really like to learn as much as I can about one topic and then move to something else, which is terrible for academia, but actually pretty good for novel writing. <laughs> there you go. Now, so you had said you'd started it as sort of a, a shorter story. Yeah. And then, and were you writing that story for a particular purpose? Was that for a... Just for fun. Just oh, for my own okay. enjoyment. Um, and the... You know, I, I had originally heard the myth at summer camp. I had heard essentially one camp counselor's version of it. And as I grew older and I read the actual sources, I, w I realized I was encountering something that was very different from what I had originally thought it was. So the Eros and Psyche story comes from the second century of the Common Era, a North African writer in the Roman Empire called Lucius Apuleius. And it actually appears in the middle of another story he's telling called The Metamorphoses or The Golden Ass, which is about a wealthy young Roman named Lucius. Interesting, interesting, <laughs> hmm, funny that, um, who is turned into the form of an ass by a group of witches and goes through all of these different adventures before finally being restored to human form by the goddess Isis. But the Eros and Psyche story appears 
roughly smack dab in the middle and Lucius overhears it, well, Lucius the donkey overhears it when he has been taken captive by a group of bandits. And it's a story that's being told to a young woman who has also been captured by the bandits, uh, being told to her by an elderly woman who serves as the cook for the bandits. <laughs> and the young woman had been kidnapped on the eve of her wedding night. She had been taken back to the bandits. She was terrified. And the old woman was like, listen, I, I know you're really worried. Let me tell you the story in which things w kind of work out. Um, and Lucius in the story, he, he's overhearing this in his hmm. ass form. And he has this phrase where he's like, and I wish I had human hands to write it down. Um, but clearly he eventually does because it appears in the novel. And there are a number of tweaks and changes I had made because one of the things I'm bringing from my academic background is a sense of what do these sources actually tell us? And what we know is we actually have a very small uh, percentage of texts from antiquity that have survived. So there is, we have one source for the Eros and Psyche myth in Lucius Apuleius, but there were probably others. There's artistic uh, depictions that are dating back to the archaic period, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of years before we have the written sources. So when I approached the myth, I, I very much had in mind of what might be, what might have been left out, what it might have been reinterpreted, what might have been Apuleius's bias rather than the original myth, and also just what possibilities exist in this myth for our interpretation now. Right, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I told you already that I very much enjoyed the book, yeah. um, for sure. And I really loved that you create Psyche as a, a bit of a shield maiden kind of type of character, right? So much, much more as you, uh, you know, without giving away too much for anybody, but you know, when she goes on later to have to do tasks, you know, the labors that she does, she's already prepared, right, to do some of these things because she, in your version, right, is being raised to be able to be an adventurer. And I love that you bring in, like, so many other characters um, yeah. from Greek mythology. So you have the Atalanta, and then you're, like, touching on Iphigenia, and, like, Achilles, and Patroclus, and um, so many other characters like that in there that, you know, uh, are very interesting, I think, for people who read Greek mythology might be more familiar if they're not familiar with, you know, already these characters. So did you consciously think, or I'm like, like where did the idea of Atalanta, for example, come in? So Atalanta was very much my own innovation. She doesn't appear in the original right, Eros yeah. and Psyche myth. Um, but part of it was, I've always loved Atalanta. <laughs> She's so cool. Like, she really... She carves a place for herself in the mythology by doing her own thing and right. by not just being the wife or mother of someone else. Um, but another really interesting aspect of Atalanta's myth is that there is a lot of romance and sensuality in it. So hmm. Atalanta has this very strong, mutually affectionate relationship with Meliager, who is briefly mentioned in the book. Um, who's the one who organizes the Caledonian bear hunt or Caledonian boar hunt um, and a few other things. And he, at one point, um, some of his cousins insult Atalanta. They try to take a prize away from her and Meliager kills them. And for an ancient Greek man to kill his own family to defend the rights of a woman is very unusual. So there seems to be a really strong relationship there. Um, there's a few different myths where Atalanta might have borne a son by Ares. She eventually marries a man named either Melanion or Hippomenes. And so there's this really interesting current of romance and desire in Atalanta's life as well. So I wanted to fold her in partly because she really encapsulated kind of that shield maiden take that I have on Psyche, but also because of the impact of romance and also the figure of Aphrodite, the goddess of love in Atalanta's own life. Yeah, yeah, true, that's right. 
Um, now, you also interestingly decide to do the book with two points of view, right? So yeah. both of the main characters get their points of view. What uh, made you decide to do that, go that road? So part of it was I, I found them the... I really got started with the book when I realized when I focused on the characters and thought about like what would it be like to be Psyche? What would it be like to be Eros? And for Eros, he was a little bit trickier to get a handle on. Um, there's some conflicting information about his origins in the mythological sources. Mm -hmm. Some of them have him being this very ancient primordial deity who was there at the beginning of the world, and for others he's the young bratty son of Aphrodite. Right. So I kind of tried to square the circle there by having him be that primordial deity, but also when the second generation of gods rises to power, he finds himself subordinate to Aphrodite as sort of her foster son. Um, but I wanted to give both of them a voice, and I found increasingly that in the drafts when I tried to do that, each of the voices brought out a lot in the other. Like Af um, Eros noticed th notices things about Psyche that like maybe she wouldn't find too flattering, but <laughs> in the end finds her very endearing as well. So yeah, I wanted I wanted to tell the story from both sides. Yeah, it, I, and I think it works. Like it definitely works um, to go back and forth. And I, I mean, I think Psyche in the end probably gets more pages. I think than, I think that's probably than, uh, true. Eros does. Um, which was fine with me, <laughs> just because you know I'm a woman and I'm like I all I love that yeah. strong female yeah. character, you know, and she's she's a go getter, right? So I, exactly. I really um, you know wanted to cheer her on, right, and get, yeah. and get through it, and and but it was nice to see growth for um, Eros too, like you know, right, because he does have growth, and you know, in the beginning it's like spoiled, as you say, like spoiled god who just like ugh, humans, ugh, you know whatever and then he you know he does develop as as the book goes on which I think is is lovely like it's a nice it's a nice piece for a god to you know have because you could be just like a god's just a god and they don't they're uncaring and don't care about anybody or anything but themselves which you know he goes back to you saying several times about the selfishness right of, of the gods in general yeah um, so I really thought that was a really nice turn for the for the book to have his point of view and then also his development as a character too. Um, so I was going to say, it's like suddenly my questions just went out of my head. <laughs> I was going to ask you. It's, gonna, it's coming back time. now. And it's coming yeah. back to me now. It'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when you were starting it, so you were writing the story during the pandemic, but how mm -hmm. long did it take you to get through writing this? I think the first draft took a around a couple, a year and a half to two years. Uh, and then the editing happened. So one thing I've learned about publishing is you will be editing a whole bunch. But this is why a published novel reads so differently from like the drafts you write on your computer, that you have professionals at a publishing house saying, actually, this character's motivation here really isn't clear. Like, I know you like this metaphor, but I'm not sure it's doing what you want it to do. Um, so there's a very lengthy editorial process as well. Yeah, oh, all right. that's, that's really neat. I was, it was funny, um, I'm sure you've probably read, have you read some of the Madeline Miller's books? Yes, right? yeah, I, I, read, I read <laughs> Cersei <laughs> four have. times. I love <laughs> yeah. that, I love right, that yeah, so I've, yeah, I've, I've read her as well. Um, so the thing that I thought was also really interesting was, because you pretty much could have picked, I guess, any time and place to put psyche yeah. uh, and that you that you did fold her into the whole you know siege of troy time period i thought was also really really interesting now did you do that very let's see did that come to you as like an idea to do or did you like just sort of like we're like oh there's troy is like something people will know it was it was a very much an innovation of my own but it was also really baked in from the earliest drafts okay and when I was writing it, you're, you're right that like I could have put it at any time. The myth itself in Apuleius is very vague about its own origins. It just says, in a certain city. <laughs> and the king and queen, who are Psyche's parents, are never named. There's not really any details to orient you in time or place, but 
I was, uh, partly I had, I had read a lot of the same sources that you had about the Trojan War, and it just seemed like there was such a zeitgeist of interest in it. Um, and also, especially towards the latter half of my edits to it, uh, this was around the time that the U.S. was pulling out of Afghanistan, where it had, mm. you know, there had been military interventions for about two decades, but not a whole lot of good to show for it. Right. And so I was really interested in thinking about what did the Trojan War look like from the perspective of the people who were at home, the people who didn't fight in it, the people who just saw their fathers and brothers and sons going off to war and never really heard from them again, um, the people who you know didn't witness any of these epic battles but just noticed like, oh, the market where we used to have these nice Anatolian rugs and spices, it's totally desolate now. Um, Another thing I was interested in exploring was the connection between the Trojan War and the Late Bronze Age collapse, which is around 1200 before the Common Era. There's suddenly this kind of, the archeological and written sources go dark. Like something happens mm. uh, throughout the Mediterranean. There's this collapse of complex civilizations. There's a lot less trade, a lot less exchange. Um, fewer artistic innovations. And I've always thought it's interesting that that's, that happened right around the time that the Trojan War, uh, or something like the Trojan War historically took place, so I wanted to explore that as well. Hmm. That, that, that's, and unless I had asked that question, I wouldn't have thought you know, of making that kind of connection uh, to something like you know, the removal of the troops from Afghanistan and like that, and I think that's that's a really fascinating thought to like look at the yeah. war from that other side, right? Because usually you're just looking at it as the glory side of everybody running exactly. off to Troy and yeah. having the the siege. Um, and th I think it's a little too simplistic to say that the message of the book is make love, not war. But that's <laughs> it's also kind of the message of the book <laughs> that like community and connection and love is better than violent self-aggrandizement. And I, I, one of the other things I think that's really fascinating that you explore in the book is what is a hero. Mm. Uh, and I, I thought that that was really interesting that you have Psyche set up uh, to be a hero, right? And her whole mission from her earliest childhood, right, is to be like, oh, I'm going to be a hero someday. And I'm waiting for this monster to come along that I'm going to slay and be famous. And then, you know, not to give anything away, <laughs> when, when she meets a character who, mm -hmm. you know, then says, you know, like, what is a hero? Like, you know, do you really want to be a hero? Like, what, what does that actually mean? Yeah. And I think that is a really fascinating thing that went through your, your thread of, that goes through your book. Like, so what were you thinking about when you were bringing that to the fore? That was also something that was really baked in from the earliest drafts, and I was very interested in interpreting Psyche as, as you described, sort of the shield maiden, the hero girl. Um, because looking at secondary scholarly sources, dating back to at least the 1970s, there are all these scholars who read the original myth and were like, Psyche has these labors. Like she has this speech before she meets the monster on the mountaintop where she's like, don't worry about me. This is my destiny. I'm facing it. Um, she's one of very few women in Greco-Roman mythology who makes the catapasis, the descent to the underworld. Mm -hmm. And these are, if you take them out of the narrative, these are all aspects of hero narratives in Greco-Roman mythology, which are usually attributed or usually attributed to the stories of men, but here we have a young woman doing them. So I really wanted to zoom in on that. I thought that was very interesting. But at the same time, a lot of the heroes of Greco-Roman mythology are, they're not the kind of people you want to meet at the pub for a drink. <laughs> like Odysseus uh, befriend, befriends and betrays a whole lot of people. He is the only member of his crew that survives to go home to Ithaca. Um, Heracles leaves a trail of bodies behind him. Like none of, none of these are really particularly appealing people for the most part. So I also wanted to, I wanted to kind of set up the hero narrative, but also subvert it because 
violent self-aggrandizement isn't where it's at. Yeah, I thought that was a great little piece of the book, so I appreciated that you went down that road. Well, so now we're going to take a little break for you to read uh, from their books. Prologue, Eros. The Greeks have three words for love. The first is philia, the kind of love that involves liking and grows up between two people who enjoy each other's company very much. The second is agape, the selfless love of parents for children or between those who are like family to one another. The third is eros, which explains itself. Connection, spark, the desire of the body to seek fulfillment in another. Most people experience at least one of these loves in a lifetime, but it is rare to have all three at once, intertwined like a golden braid. This was what the playwright Aristophanes spoke of when he wove his tale many years after the events of this one, seeking to illuminate the origin of love in its trifold complexity. He claimed that the first human beings were born back to back with two faces and four hands and four legs, each, ma each mouth chattering incessantly to its companion as they rolled like wheels over the earth. Zeus grew wary of the power of these people and split, split them apart with his thunderbolts. They turned into humans as we know them today, who walk around on two legs and speak with only one mouth. And so it is that love came to exist, the playwright claimed, each of us seeking our other half. I laughed when I heard this. I had been present at the beginning of the world, and it wasn't anything like that. It is a pretty story, though nothing could be further from the truth for Psyche and I. There is no pretending that we were two parts of some cosmic whole. She was a mortal woman, and I a god when we first met, each fierce in our independence. We were not severed halves. We were complete onto ourselves. It is possible that our paths would never have crossed at all had it not been for a chance mistake. There's something powerful in this, I think. We were not enthralled to destiny or fate, but merely the weight of our own choices. When we turned toward each other like flowers facing the sun, we were not fulfilling some prophecy or old story. We were writing our own. So how do you feel the reception of your book has been? It has been really amazing, honestly. Um, being invited here is such an honor. I've been invited to book clubs, including one in Spain, where I'm wow. Zooming in in a couple weeks. Um, you know, there's always some people it didn't land with, and that's, that's life. But um, just the, the delight that I've heard from so many people about the book, the emails I've received, the Instagram messages, and also the reception from the publishing industry has been really incredible. Uh, we have 11 different translation deals for the book, including wow. uh, Spanish, German, French, Italian, Croatian. The Turkish edition just came out last week. So it is really incredible that this little story I wrote on a whim during the pandemic is making its way around the world. You said you're working on a second book already. What's that about? Yeah, so that is about the, uh, the Argonautica by Apollonius Rhodius, which is the story of Jason and the Argonauts. But my version isn't just about Jason. I'm really interested in three unlikely heroes that are involved in that journey because if you really dig into the sources you find that Jason is part of it he's one of the POV narrators but the hero at the heart of the story is really Medea who's the princess of Colchis uh, disciple of the goddess Hecate and a witch in her own right um, and I was really interested in exploring her perspective on the events um, Jason is also part of it as well, who he's really kind of surprised me with how charming he can be. Mm -hmm. And his skill is really 
summoning other people to his cause and using diplomacy and sometimes manipulation to keep people on board. Um, and then the third perspective in it is actually Atalanta, who was one of the Argonauts who sailed on the journey. So she appears in Psyche and Eros, but you get to hear her about her younger years in book two. Oh, it sounds fantastic. Do you have a projected date for that? Uh, planned publication is 2025. All right, that's fantastic. I'll look forward to reading that next book as well. My very last question is, do you own a, li have a, own a library card? <laughs> yes. Of course I do, <laughs> of course. I actually, in the acknowledgments of my book, I thank the libraries of Cambridge, Boston, and Brookline because I wrote a lot of this novel in those. Good. Glad. Huge library fan. Glad to hear that. Of Love the libraries. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being our guest today here on A Novel Idea. We great pleasure to have you. And as I say, it was a fantastic book. I really very much enjoyed it. And if you're out there listening to us right now, thank you for joining us here. Um, you can find Psyche and Eros um, at your local booksellers, I am sure, as well as your local libraries. And please join us next time at A Novel Idea. Thanks so much.